Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Valemount Mayor Owen Torgerson. Valemount is nestled in the stunning Canadian Rockies in the province of British Columbia and is a haven for outdoor enthusiasts and nature lovers alike. Surrounded by majestic mountains, crystal clear lakes, Valemount offers unparalleled opportunities for hiking, skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, and wildlife viewing year-round. Now, in the winter months, visitors flock to nearby resorts for world-class skiing and snowboarding. As the snow melts and the landscape transforms into a playground for summer adventurers with endless trails for hiking and mountain biking, as well as prime fishing spots along the Fraser River. Now, beyond its natural beauty, Valmont boasts a charming small town atmosphere as well. Visitors can also explore the area's rich indigenous history and culture at the Valmont Museum and Historic Site. Whether seeking adrenaline pumping adventures or peaceful moments in nature, Valmont offers an unforgettable experience in the heart of British Columbia's wilderness. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick break with cross border interviews featuring. Mayor Owen Torgerson. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration at Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, but I want to start my interview, as I traditionally do on this show, by getting to know the person behind the persona of the mayor. And oh I boy. want to ask, oh, exactly. Oh, boy, he's right. I want to start by asking the same question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Owen? I think... Uh... A lot of it came from uh, volunteerism. Uh, it was quite uh, prevalent in my family. And, uh, you know, my mom is a longtime volunteer for the community, whether it was organizing festivals, whether it was uh, doing um, cooking for her church, um, uh, for uh, community members. But I, I just remember just having a, a, a bit of a calling when I first volunteered for the village uh, what was the first one? It would have been the Integrated uh, Community Sustainability Planning Commission uh, back in 2011-ish. And then shortly after that, uh, I, I, I had a lot of fun with that. It was about a 24-member uh, commission uh, really looking at you know, 30, 40, 50 years out. And what do we do now to ensure that A, uh, we're still here and, and B um, what, what does sustainability look like? Uh, is it, is it economic sustainability? Is it environmental sustainability? And it's all of those things, Chris. And it, and it really uh, spurred me to continue that sort of um, volunteer role. Uh, and at the time council had a, or they had uh, enacted a, uh, a planning advisory commission. And that looked at, so a few um, requests or uh, staff reports or, uh, you know, council of the day sent it to the planning commission and it around um, land use and, and back in that sort of era, um, you know, the registered uh, professional planners weren't prevalent in uh, smaller municipalities. And so you sent it to a group of people uh, of, of varying backgrounds and then uh, I joined with the uh, Columbia Basin Trust uh, Adjudication Committee. And what they did was 
the, the community would get uh, X amount of dollars from the trust and uh, uh, not-for-profits would uh, submit an application to, to garner some of these, you know, any grants, any grant is a contest. So uh, how you tell that compelling story in your grant application uh, might win you the day. And then I, I just, it just kept going. Um, you know, I, I, I received some funding to go to the uh, Rural Revitalization Foundation uh, or Federation. And then this time, uh, that time around, it was in Prince George. It was really quite convenient. The, the, the village uh, sponsored uh, two of us to go and uh, report back. And, uh, and, and they just snowballed Chris into uh, the 2014 election as councillor. Uh, 2018 uh, was a four, a four mayor candidate race. And then 2022, I was acclaimed. So there's a lot to unpack there that yeah. you just mentioned about. And I'm going to start by saying this. Uh, about two weeks ago, if you would have said Columbia-based trust to me, I would have said, what the heck are you talking about? But since I've been talking to a lot more small town mayors in British Columbia, I've been learning a lot more about that. So I knew exactly what you were talking about. There's my little shameless plug for anyone who wants to go back and listen to Fruitvale Mayors, uh, Steve Morsett's. Steve Morsett, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, talk about, we talk about that trust a little bit uh, more in depth. So I want to ask that 2014 election. Now, I, I, I traditionally try not to do a lot of research on my guests because I want to learn from them. But I went back and I, I, I watched an interview that you did in 20, I think it was 2014 or 2018. And it was talking about some of the issues that you wanted to champion while on council or when becoming mayor. And you talk about sustainability and you talked about sustainability quite a bit. So I want to pick up on that key word. Um, what was it about that time frame, that time, 2014, when you first decided to run for council, 2018, when you decided to put your name forward for mayor and become successful and become the mayor of Vailmont, what was going on in your head to say, this is the time that I need to put up and step up and put my name on the ballot? Because you could have done it in 2011 when you first were going through that process of working with going to Prince George, but you decided in 2014 to do it. What went through your head in 2014 that said, now is Owen's time? I think there was a uh, massive transition happening. Uh, so the, the, we had our, uh, our bigger employer, so uh, uh, Belmont Forest Products, or it was a subsidiary of Carrier Lumber out of Prince George. Uh, literally, uh, we, I was on the teardown crew uh, at the time in, in 2009. And so we we literally pieced that mill apart, packaged it up, and sent it to Prince George, where it was reassembled as a another manufacturing line for that uh, for carrier lumber. I knew at that time that we weren't going to be um, big in the forest sector anymore. Like the the Vailmount's contribution to the dimensional lumber markets uh, wasn't there. Shortly before that time, uh, the Vailmont Community Forest uh, was formed by the municipality. And I saw things happening in the forest sector where we were doing more with less. And so what I mean by that is at the time of carrier lumber, we sort of had a cutting permits in and around the Vailmont area of uh, 300,000 cubic meters. And when the Vailmont Community Forest formed, uh, the, the province allocated uh, just over, just over 33,000 cubic meters. And we were doing more, Chris, with that than what we were doing with that larger cut. And, but it was still, um, we were still sort of in that bigger transition to tourism. Uh, we had already been designated a resort municipality, so we are British Columbia's most northern resort municipality. We're one of 14 with that designation. And I just saw things around the community that were just happening. And I wanted to be in the background uh, trying to help in any which way I could. And at the time, uh, Mayor Townsend had me appointed to uh, the Valmont Community Forest Board. Uh, I have a, my family uh, has a construction uh, and forest background. Uh, she put me on the emergency management committee. Uh, she put me uh, 
on Varda. So the uh, Belmont and Area Recreation Development Association. So they were at the time really spearheading uh, snowmobiling in the in the Belmont area. And so we were relatively known as a three season town. So not much to do here in the summer. If you like it, weird that I say that, but it was true back in the day. I mean, we had a we had a, a Kim Basket Reservoir. Uh, some people call it a lake, but it's a hydroelectric reservoir. Uh, was still inundated with um, uh, trees from the 70s. So uh, back in the 70s, uh, a lot of the lake bottom timber was not uh, harvested. And so when they flooded the valley uh, due to the creation of Mica Dam, uh, a lot of that tim a lot of that timber stayed, so it wasn't really a, like a recreational um, body of water. And so, getting back to your question, uh, I just saw things, Chris, that were really coming together, uh, where we had uh, contributed uh, through a joint committee uh, with the town of Golden to pressure BC Hydro into doing uh, allocating funds through the controller water rates to clean up debris. Uh, Varda was getting into the mountain biking scene. Um, I'm going to follow up know, a little and, bit and, here and for I, a second. Yeah. I'm going to, because you, you joined council at a very challenging time for the community because there was a lot going on in the community. And now you are two almost two and a half terms into your mandate as a councillor and an elected official of your community. Yep. Are you through the darkest parts of that though? Are you through the parts where the challenges are now not as insurmountable as they were in 2014 when you first were elected? I don't think so, Chris. Um, and, and I say that because uh, we're, I think we're coming into a very challenging summer in terms of uh how much moisture we have, uh, but I'm I am elated to have partners each step of that way. So I, I'm concerned about a drier summer. I'm concerned about uh, wildfires. I'm I'm concerned about landslides. I'm concerned about um, you know a lot of geo hazards that are that may be outside of the village proper, uh, but impact residents just the same. And so we. Uh, we have partnered with the University of Northern British Columbia uh, to identify those geohazards and to uh, working with the regional district face of Fort George. So uh, a really huge partner there where uh, working with uh, ge geologists and geotechs to not only identify the hazards, but put a put a hazard rating to them and you know uh, identify the consequences. And that leads to uh, the the newer legislation that's coming at us through the Emergency and Disaster Management Act. We still don't know. We, we, the, the legislation has been enacted, but the regulations have not been published. And so um, are we through the dark times? Sure. Uh, our challenges still, uh, our opportunities still uh, apparent? Yes, they very much so. Uh, you know, so they, I, I just want to clarify this for those who are listening to this because this is not airing on the day that we're 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 recording this. Uh, this is this episode is uh, being recorded the last few days of February, and it's going to be airing in March. So maybe, and we know how fast provincial governments always put out regulations. Maybe by the time this airs, the regulations will be out. Highly unlikely, but I'm just going to put that out there. So those who are listening, going, well, they just released them yesterday. Well, let, let's let, let's see it. What we all, I'll actually believe it when I see it. Anyway, continue on. I apologize. I just need to clarify that. Yeah, no worries. I mean, uh, we've uh, we've done a housing needs assessment back in 21. That's now outdated, according to the province. Uh, the new housing regulations and zoning regulations, uh, the continual downloading from Victoria onto municipalities. Uh, we just completed uh, an official, uh, a complete rewrite of our official community plan uh, that was adopted in 21, and the province would like us to do that again. Uh, the, the, the language within our OCP, uh, meets and beats all the new regulations coming at us in terms of how Victoria wants to roll out housing. 
and yet uh, we're likely going to have to do it again in 26. Okay. And these are not cheap. These are not uh, uh, housing needs assessment is 50 grand. Uh, an OCP is 140,000. Uh, these are these are pressures that um, we shouldn't need. Like I should be sending a hundred and forty thousand dollar invoice to Victoria because whoever's making these new regulations must have taken it from our OCP, saying, "Hey, if this little town can do housing like they're doing housing," uh, because between uh, twenty seventeen and today, well, by June of this year, we will have worked with uh, NGOs, not-for-profits, uh, to support and increase our housing stock by 8.5%. And I dare any municipality to achieve the same. Okay, we've gotten into the crux of the interview, and I usually do this prior to this part of the conversation, but I think this is going to be a more in-depth conversation that we usually talk about the community rather than the person. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that this is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send emails to him, please send them to me because, you know, I like to <laughs> file them in the appropriate location well so, if you can find my email great <laughs> <laughs> with that being said i've got it i've got to sort of poke the proverbial bear here a little bit if you don't mind yeah please municipalities are being asked to do more with a lot less and they're asking especially in bc they're asking to basically rewrite rewrites and do rewrites on the rewrites of the rewrites which small towns like yours, small villages like yours, don't have an endless supply of money. I don't care where you are or who you are. You know that you do not have an endless supply of money. How do you survive? How do you become a sustainable community when Victoria is asking you to do more things that you just might not have the money to do? Well, I, I think with those kind of requests, um, Chris, the province really needs to hamper down how transfers are made to municipalities because the perpetual increase of property taxation <laughs> is certainly not sustainable. Um, Martha, Martha is, quote unquote, Martha is our go-to name for our residents. And so uh, what would Martha do? What, how would Martha react? Um, you know, we, we, we municipalities have just discovered what asset management looks like. Municipalities have just recently discovered how much those assets are worth and the replacement costs and the maintenance costs. Now the retirement costs of those assets. Um, you know, a lot of the focus is, is looking at your financial reserves. Um, does the average but, resident know that, though? Does the average resident in Belmont care about these issues that you're talking about so passionately about? Because you're right. Asset management is a good thing to have. It is important because it, it looks at the quality of uh, the sort of the infrastructure projects that are in. The small town communities, that's a pretty big, significant chunk of money that you have to put in one time sort of up cost free to, uh, to implement an asset management plan. But in the long run, it does help. But the average resident doesn't care about that, do they? Well, they don't see it, Chris. That's I think that's why, like, our our mandate uh, under the charter says you will look after your water, sewer, and roads. <laughs> Everything. Sorry. I'm, I'm not laughing at that statement. I'm laughing at the fact that you said it with a straight face, knowing the fact that you deal with a lot more issues than just those things. <laughs> well, everything else is a luxury. the the pl The planters on Fifth Avenue. That's a luxury. Parks are a luxury. Um, when you're, you're also super, dealing with healthcare as well. You're dealing with residents' oh, uh, we're, issues. We're, we're, we're dealing. We have been uh, because we take on things like healthcare, Chris. The province takes a step back. Says, "Well, you, know, you want it? <laughs> you, you you give her, bud." Uh, because this is, we, this has got to be my favorite interview that I've done so far in 2024 because you're so blunt and so honest. It's refreshing. Continue. Um, 
so if if you were if wa- if clean water comes out of your tap and your toilet flushes without backing up, it's a good day. <laughs> and that's I think that's where the and it's not just a, a, a Martha. Uh, that, that's any resident of any municipality uh-huh. or regional district. So if 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 your cost if if your taxes are keeping the water flowing and the other stuff flowing, uh, great. Uh, it's it's the it's the other things that we, as a local government, have taken on without any sort of supports from the province, and so when when the province says okay, uh, rewrite your OCP uh, to the tune of one hundred and forty or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, when your tax base is growing only by three percent annually, which I which I love. Um, it's that's sustainable growth. It's where you have these 12 and 13% population increases where you go, these oh, infrastructure can't keep up. We're going to have to replace this, that, or the other. And so even though you have population growth, your costs go up. And I don't know if Victoria really gets it where this is a good idea. This is going to build some homes in uh, on Granville uh, or you know Terminal in Maine. Great. Um, it's not going to do infill the way that Vailmount needs to do infill. And when I mean infill, I mean densifying your your um, preventing urban sprawl. So instead of building on the outskirts of town, build in the middle of the town. Densify. Uh, build at once share that fourth wall, keep costs down, and have less impact or less burden on your infrastructure. Do residents that, want to see the growth, though? Do your res- Does Martha want to see growth in Valmont today? Because uh, I talk to people across not only BC, but across Canada, and I hear the nimbyism is alive and well in rural, small-town communities. Is there the Martha nimbyism in Valmont as well that say, we don't want us to grow because we are comfortable with the way we are at right now. And we don't want to see any new improvements. We are good with the status quo. I'm certain that <laughs> uh, that side of Martha is out there. Uh, we saw even pre pandemic, we saw an influx of new residents uh, coming from the urban areas. We certainly saw that uh, during the pandemic Um you know, surrounded by five provincial parks, um, crown land, like, I mean, jump on your sled, five minutes from home, that kind of thing. Um, our uh, mountain biking here uh, has boomed. Uh, and then speaking of booms, uh, we recently, uh, and, and the project's still not done, but the Trans Mountain uh, pipeline expansion. And so, Chris, at August long weekend in 2021, so we have a population of uh, 1,052, according to the census. But on that weekend, we had close to 5,000 people here. We had 2,200 workers uh, on the pipeline expansion. Uh, tourism really didn't slow down here uh, in terms of um, the pandemic, uh, simply because we're, we're a border town. Um, And the messaging between the public health officials in either province were not were not jiving. And so uh, coming to Valmont was a great thing because you could get out and about and not be around everybody until uh, the tailgate party and everybody has a uh, is in now in proximity. And so uh, for, I think, 2020, we did not have an official case of COVID here. Uh, It wasn't until January of 21 that we actually recorded our first COVID official COVID case uh, here. Uh, It was, it was pretty cool uh, given that uh, you were able to still get out and about. um, You were able to maintain distance. Uh, Residents took it seriously. uh, Most of it. Uh, You you had, you had the loud minority that didn't. um, But I was, I was super proud of our community to, Really, if you weren't listening to the public health officials, you certainly had enough respect for our local physicians 
to say, hey, uh, maybe I don't need to go up. Maybe I don't need to go to the grocery store today. It looks pretty busy. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll go tomorrow or a less busy time. Uh, I was I was quite pleased with how the community reacted to that, and still we're able to get out and about. Um, I, I want to talk. Oh, go continue. Go ahead. I was no, going to say, I, I, want to, I want to talk about an important conversation that we sort of jokingly sort of talked about, not jokingly, but we seriously talked about it, but we jokingly talked about it earlier on. But this year is gearing up to be one of the driest in our country's probably last 20 years that I have seen. Um, Alberta just recently declared a local uh, wildfire season has started earlier than anticipated. Uh, it started a few weeks prior to March 1st. Uh, BC, uh, from our pre-conversation prior to recording this interview, I asked you how the conditions were out there, and you said they were drier than traditionally. Um, while wildfires... We never hope they are going to spring up. We know that in the current climate that we live in, they are going to. Uh, we hope that people are going to stay safe. What is the municipality doing right now? What is the village doing to prepare for the worst, but hope for the best? In the last couple of years, Chris, our partners at the Belmont Community Forest, not through their community forest license, but they also have a small renewable license uh, of about 2,500 cubic meters. They have strategically uh, harvested uh, fire breaks in and around uh, the, the community. And from a, a legislative standpoint, uh, we can enact things like uh, no burning. Uh, we can uh, go above and beyond what the province is doing in terms of, uh, you know, fire bans, that kind of thing. Um, we can't supersede the province, but we can um, enhance what the province is saying. And with the 80 or 90 leftover fires from last year, um, and how, how low the snowpack average is, uh, the village has brought together all of our emergency responders, or at least our emergency responder leads, uh, brought them into the same into into the room to ensure that uh, our, the next phase of our emergency and disaster management act plan uh, is as efficient uh, and as safe as we can make it. Outside of the municipality. Uh, that's where our jurisdiction ends. Uh, we can we can tell we can advise a property owner that perhaps uh, those coniferous trees should probably go, uh, but we can't do them. We can't do that for them. And ditto with the uh, regional district. Uh, there is no legislation uh, that, that suggests they can go to a an acreage that's filled with pine beetle leftovers with uh, a heavy understory uh, that will most certainly uh, bring fire into town uh, should that particular parcel go up. Um, we can only make suggestions of, hey, that looks like, uh, it doesn't look safe. Perhaps you would like to read this fire smart manual and, 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 and rate yourself. Um, we've, we've got some NGOs here that have taken on um, uh, display booths, say at the farmer's market, where if you conduct a self-assessment for uh, fire smarting your property, uh, you get a, a, a free uh, roof sprinkler. Um, you know, it, it, small things like that to ensure that... Are people uh, taking it serious? They are. They are. They've, uh, they've probably given out 50 or 60 uh, sprinklers last summer. And, you know, the the... the the wildfire smoke is always a good reminder that says uh, it, it it can come at any time. Um, we've been dodging a bullet for probably four years now where most of the lightning strikes have been right next to the highway where uh, our structural fire department can get after it. Uh, we've got uh, a wildfire base two or four kilometers just outside of town uh, with the, the BC wildfire folks really dedicated staff out there 
dedicated management, great communications. Uh, and these are these are the things and the relationships that we will continue to build to ensure that when the time when not if when the time comes, um, we can pull the trigger and get folks safely out uh, and down the road, um, or uh, at, at the very least ensure that our communications lines and our emergency uh, broadcast. Um, so we use what is it called? Um, Voyant alert. Okay. Uh, so you can, you can, uh, we're encouraging residents to sign up whether, whether you're in the community or not, um, to subscribe to at least the community, uh, the community emergency broadcast service. Uh, it's an app on your phone. Uh, the, the regional district's doing the same thing. It, 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 you sign up through their website. Um, but it, it's, it's before, during, and after an emergency, it's, it communications are absolutely critical. Just for for those who are listening and watching this, if you want the link to the Voyant Alert app that the mayor is talking about, it's in the show notes. So scroll down. We will make sure it's linked in the show notes. It's on the website. If you're listening to this at a later date, please download it because in an emergency, you need all the methods to your disposal that you could potentially get to. So go there and download it today if you can. Um now, we've talked about some very macro issues here. We've talked about climate change. We've talked about wildfires. We've talked about infrastructure. We talked about asset management. We've talked about housing. But you know that those macro issues don't traditionally get the average resident's attention. The average mm. resident's attention is that pothole in front of my house, that snow clearing that you guys it, just it, didn't. It, and it's my fault. Oh, don't you know? It's always the mayor's fault. Anything that does goes wrong in the community is always council's fault or the oh, CAOs. Yeah. And I've heard that a lot from CAOs, so I know that I'm not saying that in return. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual in Valmont? Because when someone comes and talks to you about that pothole or that street or that issue that they believe is the most pressing issue to them, you have to sort of help them, but realize that you may not be able to help them. How do you do that in your community? I think you just have to listen, Chris. Um, and, and Is it, you, is it you, hard to do that in 2024? As I interrupt <laughs> the person who's talking? <laughs> the, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it may seem trivial to some, but when that person is trying to explain or, 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 um, uh, let you know their concerns it, it's their priority it's absolutely their priority and and there could be nothing more important to them than that pothole or that yeah. crack in the pavement or if you don't get after it now then but you also have to look at your organizational capacity to address all of those issues and that's why it's key for a council or, or a governing board to create your your own strategic priorities um, where the majority of the community can flourish. So uh, council, this current council has identified four. Um, so uh, development and diversification, communications, um, community well-being, and fiscal responsibility. And so you have to when you have these individual sort of concerns come forward, you weigh those, their priorities against what your organizational priorities are for, again, the majority of the community. And so it, it, it's, again, just listening to their concerns, uh, trying to address it where you can, but you're not going to get to all of them. How often are you finding that your priorities are matching up to your community's needs and wants? Because you're an elected body. You are elected by the people of your community. I, and just for transparency's sake, I did a bit of research on Valmont. In the last election, you were acclaimed. Two of your councillors were acclaimed. And you had two open spots. So you had to do a call out for people to <laughs> act. I, this, this is how much knowledge I know about municipal elections. I'm that weird kid in, in high school who was going, I'm going to follow every municipal election. So how? here's here's, here's something. <laughs> before, you, before you ask the question, I want to really in reinforce what that last election looked like. Valmount, I was in, so when you appoint 
uh, the appointee must reside within the municipality. So during a general election, uh, two and a half million people in uh, BC could have run for Belmont Council. If you were appointed. Whoa, 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 what, what? Yeah, so there's you, generally. You, 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 can, you can run wherever you want. And oh, I, municipal... could have, I, I, I could have put my name on the Vancouver ballot. I could have put my name on the city of Prince George ballot. I could have put my name on the regional district of Central Kootenai. Um, as long as you are a resident in Valmount for six months prior to the election, you're over the age of 18, uh, you're a resident, of can uh, can uh, you're a, a Canadian citizen, and you haven't been disqualified from office, uh, you can run wherever you want. And so on September the 9th, 2022, we did not have enough people on the ballot to fill a council. So we extended uh, the election, uh, the nomination deadline uh, by four days. Any two people, any two people with 10 signatures could have brought their name forward and they would have been acclaimed along with my colleagues. So we move on to the appointment process. And just for shits and giggles, uh, we opened it up to uh, residents uh, outside of the municipality. So we had a bit of a meet and greet. This is what a, a council does. This is uh, your only staff member as a CAO. Um, you don't run the grader. Uh, you create policy uh, to safely run that grader, uh, but you certainly don't jump into the grader. Uh, and at the same time, we were going back and forth with municipal affairs in Victoria uh, saying, listen, you, you, you got to help us out here, like um, open it up a little bit because you've just taken the entire province of British Columbia and pinpointed into 5.17 square kilometers. And so that was the, the selection process. And I was in Nova Scotia at the time. Uh, so on the on a Wednesday, we received a ministerial order saying that we could appoint from outside of the municipality. Uh, my wife and I returned on the Thursday. We appointed on the Friday. We had our first council meeting on the Tuesday as a full council. Valmount is the first municipality in BC history to have to appoint following a general election. And we are the only uh, municipality in British Columbia that needed to appoint two ever, or more than one. Uh, so, and here I thought I was smart being all like, oh, I know about your election. That, that didn't happen last time. And I'm going, oh, the things I learned on this show about municipalities across this country is just, it, it, it can stop an alligator in its tracks. That's all I can say. And yet, and, yet, and here you thought you heard it all. I, I, okay. So going back to the original. Sorry. <laughs> no, hey, I love I it. went I off love into it. left field there. Uh, uh, hey, now I know. So that way, next time I have a question about the appointment process or where someone resides in BC, I can't ask them. So how did you know you were supposed to be running for that community? Because now I can ask, why did you choose this community to run it? Anyway. Why Terrace instead of <laughs> Tackler Landing? Exactly. Why Terrace instead of Penticton? Like, come on. <laughs> um, so going back, how do you ensure that your priorities match with the residents' priorities? Because you 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 were there elected, and I say elected because hypothetically you were first elected, then re-elected in uh, 2018, and then acclaimed in 2022. And you have to represent everyone. And that means the people who disagree with you and agree with you, and you have Absolutely. to listen to the people who agree with you and disagree with you. But at the end of the day, you have to make the tough choices. How do you ensure that your priorities match up with the people's priorities? I think we were quite fortunate uh, that through our uh, official community plan um, consultation process, it took us about 14 months. We had, we did it during a pandemic. Uh, that was exciting. But we were able to have three uh, in-person consultation um, sessions. They were all outdoor. And we had, I think, four or five sort of virtual sessions where 
community members were able to tell us their vision of what Velma would look like. And so the, the council of the day really took sort of the, the, the principles from that sort of consultation process and then the principles and the, the overarching sort of language within our OCP to really um, skirt it down to what priorities for the communities would be, for residents would be. And I, and I think council's on the right track. Um, because we, we take our marching orders from our residents. And so uh, if, if they say we want um, a, a green sky, uh, well, we're gonna have to see how much that's gonna cost. Uh, but if, and then council wants a green sky, um, then I guess we're going to have to create policy to see what a green sky looks like. Isn't and so, the simplest way to do that is just to go on Wikipedia and change the color of sky to green and then everyone believes it? Maybe, maybe, you know, I, I, I you know, if I just put it on a website, it's true. Um, but I think, it, it, yeah, just back to the, the consultation process, the, uh, the community input on the, around the OCP uh, generally aligns with what council's priorities look like. Yeah. Um, there are individual passions on council where um, an individual priority might uh, weigh more than what my personal priorities might be. Um, but generally, uh, this council is cohesive. Uh, the uh, the maybe I'll I'll jinx it, but there is no infighting. Uh, we are we are a unit. Um, you know, I, I've always tried to foster that sort of team environment where it's not just a bunch of individuals. Yeah, you have an individual vote, but at the end of the day, you are, uh, this council is a um, well-oiled machine. And I'm just super pleased with the individual efforts of each councillor or each, each member of council uh, to continue to foster that team environment. And, and even it, it, it's written on our jackets, Chris, hashtag team Belmont. We take that approach at the provincial level. We take that approach with our uh, First Nations partners. We take that approach at the regional level, uh, certainly around the council table, um, because if you, you can't do it by yourself and uh, you need that, you need that support of your colleagues if you're going to advance your community. Now, I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when it comes to municipalities, when we talk about issues. So in honor of our my great friend from Brazo County in Alberta, who <laughs> accused me, the first one to ever accuse me, of, and she knows who she is. So if she's listening, thank you. <laughs> um, what does Valmont get right? What is the thing that when you go to UBCM, when you go talk to municipal leaders from across British Columbia, or even if you go to FCM, which is going to be here in Calgary this year, so if anyone's coming down, be sure to head over and check us out while we're there, because there's my shameless plug. Um, what do you boast about when it comes to Valmont? What is the thing that your administration or your council does right? At the Union of BC Municipalities, um, we bring solutions. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, you have these, these um, 15 minutes of fame or speed dating uh, meetings with ministers. And um, more times than not, there's a handout uh, and, and, a, and a, a wish list. We bring a provincial issue and we bring a provincial solution, whether that's in... Um, Re -look, looking at how uh, emergency health services uh, are scheduled or um, how uh, paramedics can work in rural ERs. Um, we, we, we boast ourselves on uh, partnerships, relationships, and the ability to bring solutions. We, and we don't go to these things with our handout. Um, I think... And, and, and the province has reacted uh, positively uh, with those. I mean, we have uh, historic relations uh, with our First Nations partners, First Nation. Um, I can sincerely call Chief Lampro my friend. Uh, you know, our MLA is on speed dial. Um, I've worked with MLA Shirley Bond for the last 10 years. 
Um, she's absolutely outstanding. She brings a, a, a any chance she gets, she brings the team Belmont uh, message of what it's like to be uh, to work together uh, versus in a silo. That's what we get right, and it's been, it's been remarkable. I appreciate that. Now I want to turn to my last subject here, and it's my favorite subject because I've made a promise to anyone who's ever come on this show, and I'm making good on that promise this year because last year I did some health issues, but this year I'm making good on it. If you come on my show, I come to your community, and I will be in Vailmount in May because I'll be driving all the way up to the Yukon Territories to fulfill that promise as well. Wow. So I'm I'm stopping in Vailmont. And I've got to know, besides your uh, amazing fishing spots that you promised not to tell me because th- we got to keep something secret on this show. What are some that of the- bridge. <laughs> that bridge. <laughs> what are some of the great tourism spots that you would suggest to anyone, whether it be in the winter months, the summer months, they should stop in Vailmont to see? Oh, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, 10, 20, 50 hours, All right, well, um, six minutes. We're, we're, we're known as the snowmobiling Mecca. Uh, we're a backcountry paradise. Um, you cannot say no to Mount Robson. It's the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies. World uh, UNESCO Heritage Site. Um, for for the uh, uh, sort of the mobility challenge, um, a walk or a wheel around Cranberry Marsh. Uh, it's a, a wildlife management area designated by the province uh, with uh, all access uh, trails. Uh, the mountain biking here is off the charts. Um, we're getting in our little mountain bike park, we're seeing anywhere between 70 and 100,000 user days uh, every summer. Um, the coffee here, Chris. Oh, you you've I mean, worked my interest. <laughs> I mean, our, our little uh, roaster just across the tracks um, is phenomenal. Uh, the bakery here, absolutely outstanding. The pizza here, uh, you can't get enough of it. And the pints. Uh, Three Ranges Brewing uh, is uh, a, a nice little microbrewery in the downtown area. Uh, you can't, do not... You, you, you have to stop there. Um, the art gallery. Um, playing Is in the it? park. I mean, it, it's just, there's everything here that you need to stop at. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I know. Oh, I, 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 sorry. I, I, and Kin Basket. Kin Basket Reservoir, both a beauty and a beast. Uh, when she's on, she's on. When she's off, stay off. Uh, but I mean, uh, situated on the Rocky Mountain Trench between the Monashies and the Selwyn Range, um, spectacular. Well, hopefully when I stop through, we can go grab a coffee, maybe a slice of pizza, go to the bakery right afterwards before I head back on the road. Um, but there won't be any water in the reservoir in May. So yeah, you won't need to bring your, you won't be, you won't need to bring your toothbrush because the dust will brush your teeth for you. Okay, so I have one last question for you. We started by asking about duty to serve. We're ending in the most famous way possible by asking you, as the mayor of your great community, what makes Vailmont such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You're in the middle of everywhere. You're not in the middle of nowhere uh, when you're in Vailmont. You're in the middle of everywhere. Um, You've got... Um, really cool um, healthcare professionals here. Uh, f- four full-time doctors, full complement of nursing staff, um, out-of-the-box uh, education curriculum, both at the elementary and secondary levels. Uh Belmont sets you up for success, uh, whether you're a retiree or you're newly born. Uh, and it, it's just the residents. Um, they're welcoming of everyone. 
uh, super inclusive community. And uh, why wouldn't you? It, it, it's a location, location, location. I, I, I have never heard someone say we're in the middle of everywhere, but that is probably one of my favorite sayings I've ever heard on this show. It seems so true when I look at the map and I look, I, I read about your great community. Well, they, I, I coined that term quite a while ago. Uh, we had a new, uh, new uh, couple move to town. Uh, they own uh, district bikes at a camp. They opened up a satellite uh, bike shop here due to the success of the of the mountain bike park. And he he exclaimed, he's like, "Look at all these bikes! Like, I mean, downtown on on a on a weekend is just bikes after bikes after bikes after bikes." And he goes, "I can't believe it! Like, all these people are coming to the." The, the middle of nowhere to go mountain bike. I said, no, John, John, you're not in the middle of nowhere. You're in the middle of everywhere. And it just took off from there. Well, I think you have the best slogan that you need to put on every welcome sign that you have in Belmont. Um, but I want to thank you. Owen, this has been a fantastic, lighthearted conversation about municipal governance and the great community of Belmont. I'm so looking forward to visiting in May. Um, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your effort in serving your community. I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us and thank you so much for serving your community. Oh, thanks so much, Chris, for the opportunity. I really enjoyed the conversation today. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.